Hello everybody, my name is Dustin and you're watching my channel Steeplehead Studios. We are going through our next section in the Hail Caesar rulebook walkthrough and we are going to be discussing ranged attacks. Like you'll notice in Hail Caesar if you look at the profiles of an individual unit you're going to see two kind of values. You're going to see a short ranged attack and a long ranged attack. Okay, so short range are typically thrown or closer uh, quarter weapons where you're going to be six inches away to throw them. Where long range weapons or long range values are values used for anything that's beyond six inches. Short range attacks are typically represented by thrown weapons like darts, javelins, rocks. <laughs> this unit of uh, javelin in here, these skirmishers. They all have some uh, javelins, so they will be throwing about six inches away, and that's typically what every unit can do. These Hastati here, these Roman Hastati, they carry pila, but they also have a short range value on their unit profile. So they can also throw six inches. So yes, even units that are not typically ranged units in this game also have a ranged attack. We'll go over that later. And these uh, Bretonian, we'll call them Hundred Year War Archers, <laughs> they um, have bows, as you can obviously see there, and they have an 18 inch attack. But they are not using the short range value when they shoot, because their weapons are considered long range weapons. So they will be using a different value, the long range attack, as you can uh, look at a unit profile and see for yourself. And long range attacks will include pretty much anything that's not a javelin, dart, or a stone and include things like slingshots or bows, crossbows, sling staffs, artillery pieces, any anything that's basically not what these guys are holding, these <laughs> javelin men. So in Hail Caesar, there are phases that we went over before. We were talking, we were talking about the uh, command phase. Well, right after the command phase is over, you go into the uh, shooting phase or the ranged attack phase, whatever you want to call it. And that's when you deal out most of your shooting attacks. So it doesn't matter if it's short range or long range, any, any sort of attack will be dealt out at that time. Um, there are some exceptions to this rule. You can actually shoot sometimes on the opposing player's turn, and that comes when you do traversing or closing shots, but we will talk about that in a little bit. Um, so yeah, basically anything that is uh, armed with a ranged weapon in your range attack turn, can make an attack. Uh, something like these Roman Hastati here, they are obviously going to be shooting from the front. So their front arc and their front uh, whatever is in front of them here. So people here, if they had a range attack and had six inches between these javelin men, they may say, oh, I'm going to shoot at these guys. And I'd argue, oh yeah, they can because they're within range and are able to do so. Skirmishers, on the other hand, don't really have a front, as we uh, discussed before in previous videos. So they kind of have an all-around arc for shoot throwing their javelin. So they could, you know, if someone's here or here, they could elect who to shoot at. Of course, there is uh, some rules about uh, who you can shoot at and the targets, but we'll go over that very soon. So for skirmishers and open order units, the... Uh, the area you can shoot at is an arc all around, whereas formed units like these Hastati or these Bowmen, they have to go at the front arc and shoot uh, whatever's in front of them. Uh, the very basic uh, explanation there. Okay, and also here, let's say these Hoplites, they charge these Romans, and these Romans are now engaged. Obviously, these Romans aren't going to be, if, if the fight continues on to the next phase, into the next person's ranged phase, or ranged or shooting phase, the um, Romans here obviously can't throw anything, they're in combat. Another thing that the rule book states is that, say these fellows here are in support, and we'll get into support and stuff like that later, if a unit is pulled up alongside a friendly unit and he's supporting them in combat, he's engaged in the fight, these guys can't make any ranged attacks whatsoever because they are helping this unit. They don't use any ranged attack values in the ranged part of the turn. So even though these guys were, say, here. These archers couldn't shoot at them because they're engaged in the combat. Secondly, these guys here can't shoot at this engagement because they're part of the combat. They can't, you can't shoot into combat in Hail Caesar. So therefore, that these guys have no target. The best thing they could do is probably move in to support their buddies here. We'll talk about support and stuff later. But yeah, in engagements and fights, you can't 
shoot if you're in an engagement and you can't be shot at if you are in or part of an engagement. Okay, and what about the range of these attacks? I already mentioned a little bit about it, but the ranged values of these attacks are all written in the rule book. If you're doing something with short range attacks and there's something like on a, a, a character's or a unit's profile rather, if a unit profile says they're armed with like javelins, darts, or other thrown weapons, then it's six inches. Okay, so these Romans here would have a pila and they have a short range value, so I would say they can throw things at six inches. And it, yeah, it doesn't matter. There's no, there's no like ammunition in the game. So if these hoplites stayed here a turn, didn't move, and then these guys were here, they could throw something at them and they haven't started fighting yet, right? So that short range attack could attack the hoplites there. If the hoplites, for whatever reason, say they're way back here and they started to charge and they failed the charge, didn't make it, the next turn, the Romans here don't have to necessarily charge. They could sit there and throw peel at them and force them to charge. And I would do that because hoplites have long spears and long spears actually uh, negate your charge bonus. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that again later. But uh, hoplites also can't throw things. And I'll show you what split stats are. Okay, and then we were talking about the long range values. Basically, everyone has a, a short range value. But if they're armed with a long range weapon like these bows here, then uh, it says here that the bows and crossbows and staff slings particularly all go 18 inches. So they've got a considerably longer range compared to like these javelin men or these Romans over here. Uh, there's some other long range weapons in this game too. There's slings, which only go 12 inches, but they have a, a kind of bonus to them that I'll discuss later. And there's also artillery. There's different sizes of artillery. I don't have any painted up, but there's light, medium, and heavy. Light shoot uh, for 24 inches, medium shoot 36, and heavy shoot 48. So, and it kind of works where light artillery is easier to move, has a less range, and doesn't uh, pierce as much damage. And the heavier you go, the less you can move it, and the more uh, potential, we'll call it uh, morale damage, or armor piercing damage and range it has. But uh, we'll look at some of those values uh, later. Measuring the distance between a target you want to shoot at. So let's look at a formed unit, let's look at these Hastati, and I look at these guys, you know, you look at these here and you think, these are an arranged unit. But Hail Caesar actually makes use of so much ranged attacks with every unit, it doesn't matter what it is, pretty much everything has a short range value. Everything can make some sort of ranged attack. Um, so in this situation here, when you're measuring the distance from enemy to ally to figure out if they can hit or not, you have to go from the center front or the leader position. Now, it's not really clear here which model would be the leader, but we would say from the center front. So I would say about here, I would measure from this point to the closest part of the enemy. So you're not measuring from base to base, you're measuring from center front to the enemy's base. So if these hoplites are here directly in front of them and they're within six inches, these guys can throw, no problem. If these hoplites are over here and the center front here, the leader will say, can see the unit over here, which he can, these guys can throw at them. Um, and then the further you go out of the arc, I mean, you have to start using your judgment. I would say here, at this angle, okay, the, the leader at the front arc could still see him, so he could elect to throw things at them, I, I would say. But I mean, if he's way over here, you may start saying like, well, you know, his arc's off, you don't, he's too far off to, too out of the arc to actually shoot anything at. Okay, and that's for formed units. That applies to long range as well. You go to the, from the center front position of a unit and you have to see if the center front part or the leader part can see something in that front arc, they can shoot at it, okay? Now, in this situation here, if we were to say this close, let's do something like this, okay? If we were this close and the center front's here, you could yeah, you could argue, I guess you could see there, but let's say some something's just barely in the arc, and you and your opponent might agree that okay, he's kind of not in the front arc. This guy can see him though. It doesn't matter if this guy can see him. The center front, the leader position of the unit is the spot that matters the most for measuring the distance. So always informed units, measure from the center front to wherever you want on the enemy. And use your judgment if it's a little off the arc and, and agree with your opponent on how you want to hit or, 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 or not be able to hit them. <laughs> and again, the same applies with long range attacks. 
obviously they get a, a longer range to, to throw things or shoot things rather would be the better term. For skirmishers, there is no leader marker or center front position to measure from. So it's very simple. You take whatever model is closest to an enemy and throw at it. So if these hoplites here were foes, or rather if these skirmishers were enemies of these hoplites here, okay, you can say, well, this guy's closest. So I'm going to measure from this guy to that unit, to the closest point of that unit. So it works a little differently when units are skirmish or in open order. What happens is you take the closest model, regardless of um, what's there, and measure the distance from the closest model to the enemy, right? So I even have situations sometimes in a game where maybe I've set them up so most of my models are actually behind this barrier here. However, because they're open order, we just always say, okay, it doesn't matter. This is the closest model of this enemy. They are all going to use their shoot value to actually land hits and stuff like that. And I mean, they have a 360 arc, so they also don't have to go from the any front, right? It's open order and skirmish units don't have fronts, so they don't have to measure like uh, form units do, as I just explained. All right, and now nominating targets. Okay, so here I've set up a little bit of a situation where we have these poor Bretonian archers. We'll call this a fantasy Hail Caesar game, where Bretonia is fighting the forces of the Greco-Roman world. <laughs> so we have some Bretonian archers here, and it's their turn. It's their ranged attack phase, and uh, they want to shoot at something. So we have a number of enemies here to pick. In Hail Caesar, a formed unit, like so, are obligated to uh, shoot their range attacks at the closest enemy to their front quarter. So they don't get a pick what they're shooting at if something's closer than something else. So in this situation, we go from the center front, right? We go from the center front position and measure to see if we can see or uh, reach something with shooting. The Romans here are going to be the closest unit, okay? A closest formed unit, I should say. These skirmishers say they were a little closer. I can actually ignore open order and skirmish units because open order and skirmish units cannot charge your ranged units, okay? If you're in open order or you are in a skirmish formation, you cannot charge formed units in Hail Caesar. So therefore, choosing the biggest threat in Hail Caesar is the rule. You want to charge, you would have to shoot at these guys. These are the closest unit to you that would charge. You cannot choose them. They're too far away, you must choose the closest target. So in Hail Caesar, when choosing targets, that is something you have to remember. You have to shoot at the closest threat that is in your front arc, which would be these Romans here coming towards you, right? There are some exceptions to this rule, which we will go over shortly here. And the same goes for these uh, short-ranged attack open order units. Like I said here, these guys in their formed unit measuring from the center front would choose the closest enemy at hand. If this was the skirmishers over here, they would do the same. Whatever's, whatever threat or biggest threat, whatever enemy is, formed enemy is closest to them, they go from, like I said before, whatever base is closest and throws to them. So that's the difference. Again, remember it's important. Formed units always measure from the center front. Whatever the center front can see and reach, that's what you're shooting. It doesn't matter what Bill or Bob on the side here sees, it's always from the center front. Where skirmishers, if Bill or Bob is the closest model, they can throw at something like that, okay? All right, and uh, we were talking about units that are in close combat. So anyone who's engaged, whether they are supporting or directly fighting, you cannot shoot at them. So let's switch up the scenario. I like these little movement trays for this. If these two units here, these hoplites and these hastati were fighting, and these Bretonian archers were on someone's side, they could not shoot at the, whoever's their enemy's position. Why? Because they're fighting, okay? These uh, skirmishers back here can't throw anything in there. When things are engaged or fighting, you, you, you can't throw things at them, okay? Now, obviously, if you have a unit here that's engaged, but let's say that these skirmishers are over here on the other side and they are enemies of the Bretonians, these guys are blocking line of sight, okay? So even though you can't shoot into combat, you can't shoot over the combat either. Combats and engagements and supports in combat, they block line of sight. So 
You can't target an, an engagement, nor can you shoot through or over an engagement. So that uh, all affects it. Once, you, once some of the things get engaged, a lot of the range attacks become null and void unless they're supporting, which, which we'll go over soon too. In this situation, we've got some hoplites and Hastati both heading towards this poor unit of Bretonian archers. In this situation, these two units are pretty much on par from the uh, the center the center front of this unit. If you measured, you might be picky and say these guys, if you look at the angle here, the, the hoplites are technically closer, but I'm not that strict when I play. So you could tell your opponent that you're shooting at both units. They're friends here, they're not engaged. You just divide the amount of attacks you have between them. So when you've got enemies that are coming towards you at your front with your ranged weapons and they are equally or they are at equal distance apart then you can just divide your attack so if these guys have two long range attacks you can throw one on them and one on them if they're equal distance apart and you can't determine which is the closer enemy okay we've set these guys up here again here we've got some hoplite skirmishers and hastati all heading towards these bretonian arches again there is a bit of a choice of targets in this game and uh, the choice of targets varies with different kinds of units. So in this situation I've set up here, we've got these Bretonian archers here that can remember they measure from the center front. It's always the center front measuring line of sight and uh, they can choose targets based on whatever enemy's closest. So in this situation, these skirmishes in open order are the closest target. However, hold on. In the rule book, it does say that, state that the biggest threat are formed units. Why? Because open order units and skirmish units can't charge formed units. So therefore, these guys have no way, since they're skirmishers, to charge home. Okay. A couple of uh, a couple of uh, javelin throws at them is deadly, but I'd rather take a few javelin tosses than hoplites or hastati, which are way better fighters than archers, coming in at them. So. In this kind of situation, open order units, if they're closer, can be ignored when you're choosing a target, okay? So in this situation, I would say, well, these guys are open order, I don't want to shoot at them, I'm going to shoot at the hot place. I can, in this situation, elect to shoot at them. I don't have to shoot at them, I can still choose them, but I definitely don't have to shoot at these guys. So when open order units are closer, you are presented with a choice. You can shoot at the open order, unit because it is closer but you can also say okay these guys are scarier and they're formed so i'm gonna ignore the open order unit and shoot at uh, the hoplites here if these hastati were right here you must shoot at the hastati no choice okay that's just how it is they're the closest threat you want to make a ranged attack you're shooting at the hastati you don't get to choose these other guys because these guys are close if these guys are open order and these guys are open order then you could shoot at the hoplites because these open order units are not the bigger threat. These guys are. And there's a number of units you can do that with, okay? It's units in open order formation, as I just said. Artillery units in this situation can also be ignored because it's just a single model. Wagons, carts, and baggage because they're single models. Um, another thing you can do, and I'll show you an example here, is units that are only partially or partly to the attacker's front arc. So, let's move these uh, skirmishers out of the way. So if we come with a situation like this where these hoplites are super close and from the center front you can still measure and see them, but these hastati, okay, are more so in this front arc. In this kind of situation, when you look at the arc, there's under half of a unit in the front arc here. So in this kind of situation, when they're so close and the majority of the units not in this archer's arc, they can actually elect to shoot at this target. Okay, and that just makes sense because you're shooting at a bigger body of men, I suppose. But it really doesn't matter. You can still elect to shoot at these guys and have a choice in this situation, simply because uh, it's just an arc rule they have. So when if enemies get up really close like this, and if these guys are up to the side in the arc, you can choose to shoot them because they have a more they have more men, I guess, in the arc. It's not going to affect or change the stats of anything. You just have that choice. Now if these guys are like this, obviously the hoplites would be your only choice because most of the men are in the arc from the uh, 
unit and this for the center front uh, can actually see them. You got the archers here that are ready to shoot at something. Oh, but we've got this big Greek ruin that fell from the sky or shifted over in an earthquake, I don't know. And it's now blocking over half of this uh, Hastati unit here. Well, actually we should, yeah, it's about half. Let's push them over just a little, just to make the point proper. <laughs> so, in this kind of situation here, we have the Hastati unit, which is the closest target. However, over half of their unit is obscured by these ruins. In this case, you can then choose to shoot at them because they're the more out in the open target. Okay, so here you do have a choice. You can shoot at these Romans here, which would be fine because it's from the center front position over there. Or you can shoot at these guys out in the open because they would, you know, be easier to shoot at. Even though these guys are m more threatening. Actually, you know, technically they're not more threatening. They have to reposition themselves to get a charge in. These guys just can charge right away, right in, okay? So it does actually matter. These guys are kind of more threatening because these guys have to maneuver around a bit more before they get them. But that's some more technical stuff. We'll look at that. That's been discussed in the command phase. So, so yeah, when a unit's um, obscured by... Um, when the unit's obscured by terrain pieces like this and more than half of that unit's covered or hiding behind it, then you can choose to shoot at something else. If this wasn't here, you'd have to shoot at the Romans because the Ark has most of them in and they're closer there, okay? And I should say that uh, it doesn't have to be terrain, it can be a unit too. If these Hestadi, let's switch sides here, if these Hestadi were like so, and a good chunk is blocking this enemy here. If I had another enemy over here that's just a little farther away, I don't have to shoot at them because these guys are blocking the majority of the arc. So friendly units and enemy units can also affect this kind of uh, unit uh, rule when you're deciding the, uh, the site and what you can shoot at and choice of targets. All right, here we've got some mad skirmishers who have taken these ruins. We're gonna say these ruins are a building for our game. Um, if units are in a building, if enemies are in a building, you can ignore the building and choose to shoot at something farther away. So if this was a building with enemies in it, they're the closest target, but because they have cover, I guess you can ignore them. You don't have to shoot at the guys in the building, you can choose to shoot at the easier target. So you can kind of see here where all of these little examples are going. It's using common sense. So you're basically seeing where if some enemy unit is for example, a little off to the side, just barely in your arc, or peeking out behind ruins, or actually in a building like these ruins. Um, obviously, for the shooters, the easier target would be the guys out in the open, despite being farther away. So it's kind of common sense, if you think about it. Would you shoot at the guys in the building, even though they're closer, they're harder to hit, or would you shoot at the enemies coming towards you that are a little farther away, right? Um, and in this situation, you may argue that you do want to shoot at them, and that's fine. This is where choice of targets come into play. So, those are basically the uh, main choices of targets. There is one more choice of target, which I'll show you here. I wanted to throw out, there's lots of situations in Hail Caesar that this could come up. But say the Hoplites and Hestadi are the enemies of these javelin men and these archers here. Well, using the rules we just thought of, if these archers are shooting, the closest enemy would be here because from the center front position measure and you'd go there. However, you'll notice here that this skirmishing unit, the same unit here, is actually kind of blocking it, okay? Open order units block the line of sight in, in Hail Caesar as well. So remember this for screening and, and having open units in the front. They're very important to uh, stop enemy attacks or charges or such like that, but we'll get to that later. So in this situation, these guys are obscuring the majority of this unit, so you can choose to shoot at the target that's farther away and easier to hit, okay? Something else I wanna show you guys here, just before I go on to the next part, is we were talking about choice of targets, right? So what would be the choice here? Okay, well, measuring from the center front position, what the leader can see, you can see these hoplites. However, they are obscured by this ruin here, right? These ruins here are obscuring most of their unit's frontages. So you can ignore them if you wish. You can shoot at them if you want, but you can choose to shoot them over there, right? And again, if the ruins weren't there, if the ruins weren't here, 
or, or even if the runes were just slightly here, the majority of this unit can be seen, so you have no choice. You'd have to shoot at that target. No choice. But if the ruins were here, they're mostly obscured by the ruins here, so you'd have to shoot at the Romans for a clear shot. You don't have to shoot at the Romans. You can still choose to shoot at them because they are in range. There will, however, be penalties incurred, and I've been doing this wrong in my games, but uh, these guys do get a kind of penalty for being obscured by cover or friendly units and such like that. And we'll go there. Sometimes you'll be fighting and uh, remember in Hail Caesar line of sight is blocked by everything including your friends and sometimes you might want to make a gap in your lines and have your archers behind lines shooting through the gaps or maybe you don't have guys there. Maybe there's t a terrain piece and a, a friendly unit there and you have kind of this gap going between whatever's there. It doesn't matter if it's terrain or if it's a friendly foe, sometimes you're gonna, or a friendly foe, you're gonna have a, a gap sometimes. In Hail Caesar for shooting, how gaps work. Here, we have the enemy hoplites over there. So these guys wanna shoot at them. Here, there's no problem because this frontage here, this 80 millimeter frontage, is not blocked by the gap in any way or form, okay? So these guys could shoot at those hoplites and the normal shooting would happen. Um, however, sometimes gaps are smaller. Let's say that these Romans are closer and now we've got a smaller gap and the gap is now kind of obscuring the line of sight of, from the center front position. In this situation, this unit's going to have a penalty of minus one to hit. We'll go over a table soon on that. But because they're obscured by this unit and they're shooting that way, they have a minus one penalty to hit that foe because these guys are kind of blocking their sight okay um, the narrower the gap gets the harder it is to shoot through that okay so if you have a really narrow gap here you're still gonna suffer that minus one in addition to these gaps I'm gonna have to read this here because I can't <laughs> I can't like word it out in my mind but it's saying that uh, the number of attacks is reduced in rough proportion of the units frontage relative to the gap. So if the gap is equal to a third of the unit's frontage, then the attacks are reduced to a third also. Okay, so if we have an 80 millimeter frontage here and a third of 80 is something like 20, 40, 60, like 20, 25 or something like that. Let's just say it's about 20, I don't know, 26 point something. If this here is like only a third of this frontage here, they can still shoot at the enemy, but their attacks are minus one and they only get a third of their attacks on their unit's profile, okay? Now, this, I think, hardly happens. Um, usually your archers will be in the front or you're not going to be blocking your archers. If you are blocking your archers, it's probably just going to be only a little bit. In this situation, I would just say they probably get their full attack because I don't even think that's a tenth of their their uh, frontage. So they just be minus one for the obscurity. But yeah, the gap rule will affect how many attacks you get in and will incur a penalty to your actual hits when you're rolling to see if you hit enemies. But that, that rarely happens. I don't see many gaps. Um, especially if you do, like me, play Punic Wars, a lot of the skirmishers and people throwing things are always in the front. So, so that rarely happens with us. For artillery, it says, I don't have any artillery pieces, but a gap must be at least three inches wide to shoot through it all. And then otherwise, the same guidelines, which we just discussed, would apply. So artillery need at least three inches wide to shoot through a gap, because then you've got artillery hiding behind guys and... Uh, I guess you wouldn't want to risk hitting your own men. So they put a rule of three inches with artillery. Anyway, common sense rules all in the end of the day. And uh, you can modify these if you want to. But this is just, like I said, how the rule book presents them. So let's talk about the actual attacking values and dice used when you're making attacks. Here we've got these archers facing off against these Histadi here again. Um, in Hail Caesar, long-ranged attacks are always going to be a distance covered okay and it's long-range attacks or anything that are over six inches long so when I say over six inches long of course that means a weapon that can reach up to over six inches long these Hastati have these short have a short-ranged attack 
Short range attacks on a unit profile can only go a maximum of six inches ever. Okay, so these Hastati cannot throw things beyond six inches. Because these guys are armed with bows and have a long range attack value, they can shoot up to 18 inches. So their attack values, regardless of uh, if, he's, if these Romans are here or their Romans are here, they're using their long range attack value because they have long range weapons using the long range attack value on the unit profile. Short range attacks are used for support. So you'll often notice that a lot of archer units have both a short ranged and a long range attack and we'll go over the support value soon. But for now we're just talking about shooting in general. So attack values for units. Every unit's profile has a standard attack value. Typically I find for short range and long range attack it's either going to be two or threes. But um, this section here I don't usually look at in the rule book simply because every unit's profile is already kind of made up for you or you can make your own. But typically there are some dice modifiers for the size of units. If, well, if we put these two Hastati units together, let's now say it's a standard unit. Let's say this 160 millimeters is my standard unit size. Maybe the standard unit's short range value is three. Okay. If I decide if I want to make them a small unit, I subtract one of those dice values. It's no longer three, it's only two minus one for small units, okay? If I wanted to double their frontage and say they had a 320 millimeter front for a large unit, then I would add a dice. It wouldn't be three at the short range, it would be four, okay? And tiny units which don't have much are only let's say these three guys are a tiny unit they only have one dice they can't throw more than one dice in their value it's always one you don't really have to worry too much about these attack modifiers especially if you use the point supplements or use uh, pre-made uh, stats that you can find in the book or like I said in the rule book point supplement or in the supplement point book rather because all those things are available. This is more important, important if you are making your own units. If you decide that a regular standard unit in your army has five for short range for whatever reason, and then you decide to bring some short, small units, then instead of the five that you just decided, they'd have four. And if you had large, it would be six. So this is more so for the units, uh, I guess the unit stat value, but it's not something I typically look at because most unit stats that I draw upon are already pre-made. So I don't ever have to consider this unless I'm, I'm making my own modifications. Some things in the column or testudo, they can't make any ranged attacks, okay? So if you form a column formation or a via of Romans from the uh, Imperial Age, let's say, and they form a testudo, they can't make any ranged attacks at all. So column and testudo are right out for ranged attacks. If you form a square, like we talked about in previous videos, as squares are only limited to a maximum of one dice when shooting. So when you form a square, you've lost kind of your shooting ability. You're limited to only one dice. And uh, in buildings, buildings, depending on how you've faced them, let's say we have a building here. Say this is a square building and the Romans are faced out looking this way. They only get a maximum of two dice per face, okay? So that's per turn. So, th so the total attack value is only going to be two per face. So if they want to shoot two out this way, that's all they get. Despite having guys here, maybe they only put two out there. Okay. And normally a standard unit Romans have three, but in a building, they only have two per face of the building. But for actual shooting values, let's say that these Romans are here and they're within, let's say seven inches. I, let's, let's say that's about seven inches from these um, archers here. What you do is you take the short or, range, short or long ranged value on the unit's profile and roll that many dice to see what you got. So let's say these archers have two long range and I'm using a long range weapon so I'm throwing. All right, well, that's a really good roll for shooting. Two sixes, okay? On a hit, a hit would be normally four, five, six on your standard unit, okay? And that means that they inflict some damage. However, there are some exceptions to this rule. Uh, if you roll a six, like I just did, I rolled two six, this unit actually has to take a break test. Okay? So anytime you roll a six on shooting, doesn't matter if it's short ranged or long ranged, 
and you roll a six and hit them, that means this unit automatically has to take a break test. It doesn't matter what situation or how healthy they are or if they've taken damage or not, they will take a break test. So I guess some art, consider it some very scary arrows or they're kind of critical hits, if you will, even if they don't do damage. But rolls of six will force break tests upon shooting, okay? Um, once that happens, and we'll look at break tests happens. Once that happens, they roll for a break test, and we'll look at break tests later on. However, so they're going to have modifiers in Hail Caesar when it comes to shooting. Now, in this kind of situation, I was shooting at a unit here that's heavy, okay? Hastati units are heavy, and they have shields. Units that are heavy, a heavy type of unit, and have a shield, have protection against shooting. So normally shooting at these guys here would be a four, five, and six to hit. However, because they're heavy and have shields and they're getting shot at their front, all three of those are, are essential. They are heavy, have shields, and are getting shot at the front. These guys are minus one to hit. And it's like, why? Well, I guess the reasoning is that they're hiding behind their shield, so it's just harder to hit the actual human there. Now, some people argue that they should be easier to hit because they're easier targets. But I mean, I, I understand why the rules have done this because you're hitting the shield, you're not actually hitting the man behind the shield, if you will, right? So it's just minus one to hit. So in this situation, when I roll the two sixes, it's actually not four, five to six to hit these heavy units. It's five and six to hit these units because of their heavy shields, their heavy troops, and they're at the front here. So in this kind of situation, shooting at these heavies here, at the directly at the front, is harder so you need a five and six not a four five six if these guys were like this and they were getting shot at the flank or the rear it would still be four five six no modifier it's only when they're facing the shooters like so that you uh, have to uh, put that uh, modification in okay also let's say let's put another modifier out here while we're at it Let's say these guys are shaken, okay? We haven't talked much about shaken, but we will. Let's say they're shaken or disordered. When you're shaken or disordered, you're minus one to hit, okay? So that means if they're shaken and disordered, they would need five and sixes to hit. Also though, because they're shaken and disordered and they're shooting at a heavy unit with shields at the front, they're minus another one because these guys have that protection. So they need sixes to hit. Now I told you when you roll a six in Hail Caesar, this enemy has to do a break test. However, because I rolled, let's say, let's say I roll a five and six here, there's two hits here, but I only rolled one six. When you require a six after modifications to hit a foe, you must roll two sixes to cause them to have a break test, okay? I rolled really well, I rolled two sixes. So regardless of my penalties, these guys would be having a break test, okay? Now let's just do this for fun to see what happens, okay? So I rolled two sixes regardless of the results that's a, or modifications. That's a hit on these Romans. And the Romans have a four and five up armor save. And I rolled a two and a six. So the Romans here are taking one wound, but they still have to take a break test because I rolled a six earlier. And a nine is really good against shooting, so the Romans are gonna be staying there. But yeah, that's basically how that uh, would work if you rolled a six. I'll do another example here just to give you an idea. Seven inches away, they shoot. Oh, they miss completely. And that roll there. Again, they shoot again, let's just say for fun. In this situation, I need a five and six because they're heavy with shields in the front and I rolled a five. And then the Romans would do a morale test and they fail, they take another wound. And we'll go over more of that soon. I just wanted to show you a, a quick example. And regardless of modifiers, a six is always a roll to hit. But if you're absolutely required to roll sixes, you need two to do the break test. So let's just quickly talk here about modifiers to hit with ranged attacks. I went over shaken and disordered. If a unit is shaken or disordered, it's minus one to their dice roll, as I just kind of showed you here with rolling. So if they're shaken or disordered here, it would be five and six to hit uh, this unit. And again, because of heavy shields, it'd actually be six to hit this unit. Maybe we'll put them, maybe we'll put them this way. <laughs> here, because they're shooting at the rear here, if they're shaken and disordered, it would be minus one, so it'd be five to six to hit that target there. Now, if they're both shaken and disordered, they don't stack. Regardless if they're shaken and disordered, or they're shaken or disordered, 
it's always minus one. So you can't be minus two for being both shaken and assorted. It's always minus one. It's just either or or both on that situation. Okay, another modifier to hit minus one is partially obscured units. Let's say these hoplites are on my side here and they're fighting here and the unit, well, they're not fighting yet. They're about to fight and they're set up in this way for whatever reason. Here, actually, we should move them over a bit just to make it look appropriate. Here, they're shooting at those Romans. They're the closest target, right? Well, they're not anymore. Well, yeah, they're the closest target and here they're obscured by these guys. So because of the obscured target there, they can choose to shoot at that farther target, which is fine. But let's just say they want to shoot at them. Maybe they want to get some damage in there. It's going to be minus one to hit because these hoplites here on their team are blocking a good chunk of that unit over there. So to actually hit them, I'd be minus one because of that the friends in the way. But they also have heavy shields, so it'd be another minus one. So I'd need to roll sixes, which I don't. Snake eyes is not what I want, and that'd be a miss there. So if units are partly obscured, okay, if units are partly obscured or in open order. Skirmishers are really good at screens. If all these Hestadi are coming here, and these skirmishers are in the way, first of all, all units block line of sight in this game. So if these skirmishers are spread out in a way like this, okay, if you shoot the, those skirmishers, you are minus one to hit. Units that are in open order, they are minus one to hit. Now, here you could say that, okay, let's say the skirmishers like this, they're screening these foes, or yeah, they're screening their friends behind them there. Now, this guy can ignore the skirmishers, like I said, and go for something further on. He cannot shoot at them because this general bulk of the units actually blocking the frontage. There's open order guys still block line of sight. However, if you wanted to look, you could see that, okay, maybe I can hit them. But these skirmishers are still obscuring most of that unit. So he could elect not to choose them and shoot at the farther unit. And then be minus one for this unit blocking the majority of them, plus minus one again to hit the guys with heavy <laughs> and shields, right? So there's a lot, there's a lot more to shooting than just shooting. You gotta look at all these modifiers, okay? So it's minus one to shoot at partly obscured units like that one there, or open order units like that one there, or if they're tiny units, or if they're artillery units or baggage, okay? So that's gonna be minus one. As I just said, I was talking about shielded formed heavy infantry attack from the front, or Formed cataphract cavalry, regardless of the direction attack. Okay, so that's something good to know. I've never dealt with cataphract cavalry, but they are so heavy that if you shoot at cataphract cavalry from any 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 location, from rear, from side, from front, it's always minus one to hit. I guess that's why they wore so much armor to have the have the arrows pelt off their skin, right? <laughs> Those oven armored wearers, whatever they're called. And again, shielded guys, heavies from the front, like so. Or minus one to hit. If these guys had two end weapons, they would be four, five, six to hit because they don't have shields, right? Closing and traversing shot are minus one to hit. So we need to also consider that, and we'll get to that when we get to the closing and traversing shot. But when performing a closing or traversing shot, it's minus one to hit. And finally, long range attacks are minus one to hit. Any attack that's over 12 inches is minus one to hit. Yes, even if you're armed with a long range weapon, it's minus one to hit. So let's do something like this. These archers can shoot up to 18 inches. If these skirmishes way over here are, let's just say 16 inches away and they, we'll put the hoplites there. These guys wanna shoot at them. Okay, they shoot at them. These guys are really hard to hit at longer ranges. Why? They're open order, so it's minus one to their modification, but they're also over 12 inches away. So I need sixes to hit them, right? Four, five, six to normally hit, but they're over 12 inches away and they're open order. So, oh, I got a six. So I would deal a wound to these skirmishers if they have no armor save, let's say they normally don't. However, because I required a six to hit them, they don't take a break test because I need two sixes to force them into a break test. Another thing I want to leave you with, I don't know if it comes up later, but I'll go over it later. You will see in some unit stats something called a split stat. You'll see like a short range attack says 3 slash 0. What does that mean? Well, short range attacks in Hail Caesar 
also covers support attacks, how many dice you can use in support. We'll go over that later. But some forces can support friends with their short-range attacks, but they're armed in a way that don't allow them to wield short-ranged weapons like javelins or darts. Hoplites are a good example. Pikemen are a good example. They have these three slash zero stats where it means they use the short range value for supporting friends in close combat, but that slash zero means they can't make range attacks at all. So hoplites can't throw things at anyone. Hastati are just a short range of two or three if it's a standard unit. I have small ones. If they're a short range of two, that means they can do a short range of attack up to six inches, as I described earlier. And they can put two into supports, which we'll talk about later. So, if you are fighting a lot of enemies with slash stats, three slash zero, it's good to pile up range attacks on them because they're not going to shoot back. And it's good to have these little skirmish units around them because they can invade and stuff, which we'll go over later. But yeah, if you see that three slash zero stat, it basically just means that unit can't do any ranged attacks and only does attacking with a short value in the uh, short range support engagement parts of the turn. But we'll go over that later. Anyway, thanks for watching this first part of the ranged attack section of the Hail Caesar rulebook. We are going to be looking at morale saves involving all these ranged attacks. Uh, what else are we looking at? Talk a bit about casually shaken and shattered units next time. And I think I'll make the range attack section into three parts. So thanks for watching. If you want to see more of this content, please like this video and subscribe. We will continue on with a walkthrough as we go when I find time. So thank you for watching and have a good one.